In other words, it was very unlikely they could have come about through just a kind of a contingent combination of parts over even millions or billions of years, but rather, in a sense, had to be created whole cloth all together at once because everything fits together so well that to remove one part, the thing wouldn't function. Have other scientists acknowledged these design features of the flagellum? Yes, they have. Uh, if you could advance the next slide. In 1998, a man named David DeRosier wrote an article in the journal Cell, which is a very prestigious scientific journal, uh, entitled The Turn of the Screw, the Bacterial Flagellar Motor. Uh, now, David DeRosier is a professor of biology at Brandeis University in Massachusetts and has worked on the bacterial flagellar motor for most of his career. Now, in that article, he makes a statement, quote, more so than other motors, the flagellum resembles a machine designed by a human, close quote. So David DeRosier also recognizes that the structure of the flagellum appears designed. What I wrote was, this is a machine that looks like it was designed by a human, but that doesn't mean it was designed, that is the product of intelligent design. Indeed, um, this more has all the earmarks of something that arose by evolution. Using an electron microscope, de Rosier produces ghostly pictures like this one, revealing the inner workings of what's been called the world's most efficient motor. This is the drive shaft. This transmits this torque generated by the motor. That would then turn the propeller, which would push the bacterial cell through the fluid. Michael Behe has argued that the flagellum could not have evolved since its parts have no function for natural selection to act on until they are fully assembled. But evidence that refutes Behe's claim of irreducible complexity comes from a tiny syringe that injects poison found in some of the nastiest of all bacteria. This is a structure found, for example, in Yersinia pestis, the bacterium that causes the bubonic plague. And look at the similarities. Now, this structure doesn't rotate, but it still has to extend this structure, which is equivalent to the rod, the drive shaft here. It has to extend that because it needs this little channel. It's like sort of like a syringe. So the the virulence factors that are made inside the cell, which is down here, can be exported, pushed up into this hole, and exported out through this long kind of needle, perhaps into a cell in your body or mind, and thereby create misery. And it turns out the two structures look similar for a reason. The syringe on the right is made of a subset of the very same protein types found in the base of the flagellum on the left. Though the syringe is missing proteins found in the motor and therefore cannot produce rotary motion, it functions perfectly as an apparatus for transmitting disease. So if we think about uh, what it means to be irreducibly complex, the argument is that if you take away even one of these proteins that the structure uh, cannot function. And yet here is a structure that functions that is missing several of the proteins and yet here it is a working viable organelle of the bacterium. So indeed this structure is not in that sense irreducibly complex. To emphasize de Rosier's point Miller arrived at court making an unusual fashion statement. As an example of what irreducible complexity means, advocates of intelligent design like to point to a very common machine, the mousetrap. And the mousetrap is composed of five parts. It has a base plate, the catch, a spring, a little hammer that actually does the dirty work, and a bait holder. The mousetrap will not work if any one of these five parts are taken away. That's absolutely true. But remember the key notion of irreducible complexity, and that is that this whole machine is completely useless until all the parts are in place. Well, that, that turns out not to be true. And I'll give you an example. What I have right here is a mousetrap from which I've removed two of the five parts. I still have the base plate, 
the spring, and the hammer. Now, you can't catch any mice with this, so it's not a very good mousetrap. But it turns out that despite the missing parts, it makes a perfectly good, if somewhat inelegant, tie clip. And when we look at the favorite examples for irreducible complexity, and the bacterial flagellum is a perfect example, we find the molecular equivalent of my tie clip, which is we see parts of the machine missing two, three, four, maybe even 20 parts, but still fulfilling a perfectly good purpose that could be favored by evolution. And that's why the irreducible complexity argument falls apart. But Behe testified it's not just microscopic organisms that are irreducibly complex. Evolution, he says, fails to account for the network of organs and cells that defend us from disease. Has the theory of evolution, in particular natural selection, explained the existence of the defensive apparatus such as the immune system? No. Do you consider it a problem? <laughs> I certainly consider it to be a problem. But other scientists who think that Darwinian evolution simply is true don't consider much of anything to be a problem for their theory. If you could highlight the second full paragraph of Darwin's black box, page 138. What you say is, we can look high or we can look low, in books or in journals, but the result is the same. The scientific literature has no answers on the question of the origin of the immune system. And in the context, that means that the scientific literature has no detailed, testable answers to the question of how the immune system could have arisen by random mutation and natural selection. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. What I did was to pile on the witness stand articles all having very sophisticated explanations for how the immune system evolved. And it basically challenged him to respond given the claims he'd made. Now, Dr. Behe, these articles rebut your assertion that the scientific literature has no answers on the origin of the vertebrate immune system. No, they certainly do not. My argument is that these articles have no detailed, rigorous explanations for how complex biochemical systems could arise by a random mutation and natural selection. And these articles do not address that. And then he starts to say, well, have you read this book, Dr. Behe? And he starts to pile these up on Behe's witness stand. Eventually, Behe was almost dwarfed by the stack of scientific literature on the evolutionary origin of the immune system. All these hard-working scientists published article after article over years and years, chapters and books, full books, addressing the question of how the vertebrate immune system evolved. But none of them are satisfactory to you. That's a lawyer's trick. Purely a lawyer's trick. Now, you know, was Michael Behe going to read every one of those books before he responded? You know, it was uh, totally theatrics. Uh, Mr. Rothschild, would you like your books back? They're heavy. The defense case included three expert witnesses. And on the last day of testimony, the final defense witness told the court about a creature that by now was familiar to everyone. I'm Dr. Scott A. Minnick. I'm an associate professor at the University of Idaho in microbiology. Dr. Minnick, can you give us an example of design at the molecular level? This is a bacterial flagellum. Uh, this is a system I work with. Uh, we've seen that? I know. You're going to see a little more of it, Your Honor. I kind of feel like Zsa Zsa's fifth husband here, you know. As the old adage goes, I know what to do, I just can't make it exciting. But I'll try. Now, you specialized your focus and research on the flagellum, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And you've done experiments on the flagellum. I have. And you've written peer-reviewed articles on it. Yes. Now, Dr. Minnick, a complaint that's often brought up, and plaintiffs' experts have brought it up in this case, is that intelligent design is not testable. It's not falsifiable. Would you agree with that claim? No, I don't. I have a quote here from uh, Mike Behe. In fact, intelligent design is open to direct experimental rebuttal. To falsify such a claim, a scientist could go into the laboratory, place a bacterial species lacking a flagellum under some selective pressure, for motility, say, grow it for 10,000 generations, and see if a flagellum or any equally complex system was produced. 
if that happened my claims would be neatly